To realise the impact of this last news on Nagumo and his staff, it must be remembered that they had no suspicion that enemy carriers were anywhere in the vicinity of Midway. Cordons of Japanese submarines stationed between Hawaii and Midway were supposed to have warned of any sorties from Pearl Harbour, but, unfortunately, the submarines had reached their scouting positions only after the American carriers had passed to westward of those areas. The Japanese carriers were like a family moving its possessions into a new home while a fire rages in the house next door. Uncomplaining, the crews, who had just replaced torpedoes with land bombs, now set to work replacing land bombs with torpedoes. At the same time, planes returning from the midway strike had to be recovered. At 8.55am, as these two operations were drawing to a close, Admiral Nagumo sent a blinker signal ordering his ships to proceed northward after recovering planes. We plan to engage and destroy the enemy task force. He radioed to Admiral Yamamoto, Enemy force of one carrier, five cruisers and five destroyers sighted at 8am, Bear Ming 10 degree, distant 240 miles from Midway. We will proceed to meet it. It had taken almost two hours to rearm and ready the planes in Nagumo's carriers. At 9.20am, just as some of them, three fighters and 27 torpedo planes, each in Akagi and Kaga, and in Hiryu and Soryu, three fighters and 18 torpedo planes apiece, were ready to be spotted on the decks for takeoff. Screen ships reported the approach of enemy carrier planes. Excitement and activity reached fever pitch as the torpedo-bearing attackers tried to score. So skillful and energetic were intercepting fighters that no more than a dozen torpedoes were actually launched at Nagumo's carriers, and thanks to excellent ship handling, none of these hit. The success of this defence does not detract in any way from the bravery and daring of the attacking pilots. They did their best and bore in to the last man. Their effort was greatly admired by Japanese witnesses who survived this day. Post-war accounts show that of 41 attacking torpedo planes from three enemy carriers, only six returned safely. In the meantime, our own planes were being readied for a counter-attack against enemy ships. The preparations were so spurred on by the aerial battle that by 10.20 a.m. Admiral Nagumo was able to give the order to launch when ready. Engines roared their warm-up as the four huge carriers turned into the wind. The lead planes were just starting to roll forward for takeoff, when enemy dive bombers suddenly came screaming out of clouds directly overhead to loose bombs at close range. Four direct hits on Kaga, three on Soryu, and two on Akagi knocked these three carriers out of action almost simultaneously. Had the attack come ten minutes later, the flight decks would have been clear and the carriers might have survived these hits but their decks loaded with fully armed planes and hazardously stowed bombs and torpedoes, all three ships were soon blazing infernos. They were shaken by numerous explosions which increased the fire destruction and killed many men. Of the four carriers, only Hiryu was able to continue the fight. At 10.58am she launched six fighters and 18 bombers led by Lieutenant Kobayashi. They struck Yorktown about noon, Pilots of the three fighters and five bombers which got back from this attack were able to report that the American carrier had been damaged and left dead in the water. At 1pm, Lieutenant Tomonaga led a flight of six fighters and ten torpedo bombers from Hiryu's deck, and he reported at 2.45pm that they had scored two torpedo hits on another carrier. Half of Tomonaga's planes failed to return. Both of these attacks from Hiryu had struck the same target, Yorktown. She had been hit seriously by the first attack, but amazing damage control by her crew had the carrier operating and in action again within five hours. Thus it was that Tomonaga's planes reported they were attacking another carrier. These final efforts by Hiryu were eclipsed at 5.03pm when 13 United States dive bombers singled her out for attack. Four bomb hits caused such fires and explosions that the great ship had to be abandoned early in the morning of 5 June. A few hours later, at 7am, a scout plane from light carrier Hosho sighted the smouldering and drifting Hiryu. Admiral Yamamoto ordered destroyer Tanikaze to her reported position, but at 6.20pm, before Tanikaze could reach the scene, Hiryu sank. Japan thus lost four fleet carriers in less than 24 hours. The magnitude of this defeat was beyond imagination. 
The commanding officer of Hiryu and Soryu chose to go down with their ships, as did Admiral Yamaguchi, the commander of Carrier Division 2 in Hiryu. Several other officers, including Admiral Nagumo, were also determined to take their lives out of shame for this defeat, but they were dissuaded by colleagues. United States losses in this battle came to one aircraft carrier and one destroyer sunk and 147 planes destroyed. The loss to the Japanese Navy was considerably greater. Four carriers and one heavy cruiser sunk, a heavy cruiser and two destroyers moderately or heavily damaged, light damage to three other ships, and three 32 planes failed to return. American newspapers promptly reported this battle in headlines as big as were used at the time of Pearl Harbor, but this time the news was of victory. Papers in Japan, on the other hand, reported merely what Imperial General Headquarters authorised, which was that one American carrier had been sunk and one seriously damaged in a great naval battle, that Japan had won a great victory in invading the Aleutian Islands, and that there had been a naval action in the vicinity of Midway. News of the loss of the four fleet carriers was dribbled out to the homeland public over a period of a year following the battle. In addition to Japan's loss of ships and planes, there was the serious loss of men, especially of skilled pilots, who were thereafter in short supply for the remainder of the war. Survivors of sunken ships were held incommunicado until reassigned, and they were under strict injunction to keep silent about the terrible defeat Japan had suffered. Almost 40 years earlier, two capital ships of Admiral Togo's fleet were sunk by Russian mines off Port Arthur, and the news was kept from the Japanese public for six months. The facts of the Midway battle were not divulged to the people of Japan until after the end of World War II. All the strength of Admiral Yamamoto's mighty combined fleet went for naught in this critical battle. His own main force turned back to the homeland upon hearing reports of the carrier debacle. Vice Admiral Kondo's invasion force also withdrew without an invasion effort. The carriers alone had engaged the enemy. They fought bravely and suffered mightily. So great was Japan's defeat in this one battle that the resourceful and skillful enemy must have been supported by the wrath of an avenging god. There were many reasons for the defeat suffered at Midway. The ultimate blame, however, may be laid to Japan's unbelievable successes during the first six months of the war. These early successes gave rise to an arrogance, aptly characterised as victory disease, which engendered negligence and a lack of vigilance. As I see it, this fatal arrogance was terminated, so far as Japan's navy was concerned, by the Battle of Midway. Subsequent defeats had other causes. The people of Japan have always attributed success in war to divine help and guidance. By this token, they had to attribute the outcome of the Midway battle to the working of a super-demon. On 7th August 1942, the United States 1st Marine Division invaded Tulagi, Florida and Guadalcanal at the southern end of the Solomon Islands chain. This was the first of a long series of Allied invasions in the Pacific, which would end only with the defeat of Japan. Not even the most far-seeing members of Imperial General Headquarters appreciated the full significance of these landings until long after the event. The Allies, having envisaged that the Pacific War would be long drawn, planned to advance on the homeland of Japan from the south, starting with the Solomon Islands and bypassing the strong points of Japan's defensive perimeter. It is surprising that Imperial headquarters never expected this wisdom of the enemy, and instead clung to the belief that a series of quick victories for Japan would make possible a negotiated peace. But then General Headquarters was still enthralled, if not intoxicated, with Japan's successes. The loss of four carriers within 24 hours in the Battle of Midway had been quite a blow, but the situation was not desperate. If the war had ended within two years, as Admiral Nagano had estimated, the Midway loss would have been the only real setback in the first quarter of that period. There was a long way to go, and the Japanese Navy still had carriers Shokaku and Zuikaku, scarcely six months old, and light carriers Ryujo, Junyo, Hiyo and Zuiho. Giant Taiho, 32,000 tons with her complement of 62 planes, plus 21 in reserve, would be in service within a year, and battleships Issei and Huga were being converted by the addition of plane platforms to their afterdecks. Supercarrier Shinano was scheduled for completion within two years. 
Aside from the carriers, the surface forces of Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto's combined fleet were practically unscathed, and their strength was still almost double that of the United States Pacific Fleet. If these two navies were to meet in a mid-ocean engagement, it seemed fairly certain that Japan would emerge victorious. Japanese naval strategists were eager that the engagement take place before their favourable balance of power was upset by the industrial capacity of the United States. The Japanese army, on the other hand, was completely absorbed with its occupation of the newly conquered territories of Southeast Asia. The staffs of the various army forces were busy exploiting resources, winning the cooperation of the populace and conducting the administration of their territories. While the army was concerned with these efforts, making sure that all newspapers under its control were giving them proper notice, the United States Marines landed on Guadalcanal. Thus, while the Japanese army concentrated on politics and economics, the growing military might of the United States was fighting a war. Were it not for the bloody six-month struggle that took place between Japanese and American forces at Guadalcanal, beginning in August 1942, this remote island of the South Pacific would have remained unknown to the world. The first wartime occupation of the Solomon Islands had occurred three months before, in early May, when token Japanese forces landed on Tulagi and Guadalcanal. The peaceful and seldom-used anchorage at Lunga Point on Guadalcanal received a small naval landing party commanded by Lieutenant Commander Okamura, whose principal arms consisted of two old howitzers and three machine guns. The force which landed at Tulagi boasted nothing more. By any reasonable view, these Japanese efforts were unrealistic. As of the summer of 1942, these islands were vital, and their defence should have been taken up seriously and in strength. A rudimentary understanding of this principle should have called for the development of an airstrip and a supply of fighter planes to ensure command of the air, as well as the maintenance of daily reconnaissance flights to guard against surprise. By early August, when Japanese planners took up these considerations, the enemy was already moving into the Solomons. Imperial General Headquarters, incapable of properly evaluating enemy moves at this juncture, at first regarded the Guadalcanal landings as an isolated local operation of little consequence. The army estimated that there would be no difficulty in driving the enemy forces from this island outpost. The Japanese Navy, less sanguine about the matter, realised that an enemy airbase on Guadalcanal threatened the defensive perimeter which had been built up in the first eight months of the war and saw that an enemy foothold in the Solomons could disrupt Japan's command of the South Pacific. This realisation prompted Admiral Yamamoto to order his second and third fleets and Tinian-based air forces to advance to Rabul. Upon receiving news of the enemy landing at Guadalcanal, Vice Admiral Gunichi Mikawa, commander of the 8th Fleet, sorted from Rabaul with five heavy Chokai, Aoba, Kako, Kinugasa, Furutaka and two light cruisers, Tenryu, Yubari, plus destroyer Yunagi, to strike at the invading forces. Mikawa's force was sighted late in the morning of 8 August during its run south to Guadalcanal by an Australian scout plane, but the pilot foolishly maintained radio silence and continued his search before returning to base to report. As a result, the Allied ships were caught completely off guard. The Battle of Savo Island, which the Japanese Navy called the First Naval Battle of the Solomons, began in the first hour of 9 August and was over by 2.30 a.m. Four enemy cruisers were sunk, and one cruiser and two destroyers damaged in the brief one-sided battle, which left Mikawa's force practically untouched. Allied losses were cruisers Astoria, Quincy, Vincennes and Australian Canberra sunk, cruiser Chicago and destroyers Ralph Talbot and Patterson damaged. The glory of victory in this action was considerably dimmed in that the enemy transports, with priceless troops and supplies, remained intact. As Mikawa's ships withdrew, he discussed with his staff the feasibility of making another attack. But fear of possible dawn air attacks from enemy carriers, known to be south of Guadalcanal, induced Mikawa to return to base. With most of the protecting enemy warships sunk or damaged, Mikawa could easily have raised havoc with the transports. His failure to do so enabled the invaders to get a firm foothold on Guadalcanal, leading to their conquest of the entire Solomons. 
Dire as were the consequences of Admiral Mikawa's decision, he should not be held solely to blame, because it was traditional with the Japanese Navy that warships, not auxiliaries or transports, were the principal target. Mikawa was overcautious about the danger of air attack, and undoubtedly he was also influenced by the recent debacle at Midway. But it would have been worth the sacrifice of his entire force if he had knocked out the enemy transports at Guadalcanal. Another factor in Admiral Mikawa's decision was the attitude of the Japanese army, which, with but slight knowledge of the United States, had always considered Soviet Russia its primary enemy. Little thought was given to the prospect of land fighting against American troops, and accordingly there was little concern for their fighting ability. At army headquarters it was felt that the invaders of Guadalcanal could easily be driven from the island. On 21 August occurred the first decisive clash at Guadalcanal. The focal point of action was a Japanese airstrip, which had been under construction for only a few weeks when the enemy struck. Most of the defending Ichiki detachment was annihilated. Four days later, the rest of the Ichiki regiment, the regiment which had been scheduled to invade Midway two months earlier, was sent to reinforce Guadalcanal, under protection of all available Japanese surface units. The Army High Command obviously was still confident that the reduction of the enemy in the Solomons would be a simple matter. The Imperial Navy, on the other hand, deeply concerned about the strength it might meet in supporting this landing operation, called to the task Vice Admiral Nobutake Kondo's 2nd Fleet and Vice Admiral Chuichi Nagumo's 3rd Fleet. On 24 August, this combined force of two aircraft carriers, three battleships and other warships, engaged United States Task Force 61 under Vice Admiral Frank Jack Fletcher in the Battle of the Eastern Solomons. The action lasted into the next day and resulted in the loss of carrier Enterprise for the United States and carrier Ryujo and one destroyer for the Japanese Navy. Most important, however, was that this second Japanese effort to reinforce Guadalcanal failed completely. During September, the enemy strengthened his position on the island and enlarged the airstrips. At the same time, the situation became increasingly worse for Japan. One highlight in the generally disappointing war record of Japanese submarines came on 15 September, when torpedoes from 7 to 19 accounted for the sinking of carrier wasp near Espiritu Santo. There were many aspects to the Guadalcanal reinforcement effort. On 11-12 October, the Japanese Navy lost heavy cruiser Furutaka and destroyer Fubuki, and the force commander, Rear Admiral Aritomo Goto, was killed when heavy cruiser Aoba was seriously damaged in the Battle of Cape Esperance. Two nights later, battleships Congo and Haruna gave a boost to Japanese morale when they bombarded Guadalcanal airfields and shore installations for an hour and a half with their 16-inch guns, inflicting great damage. Land fighting on Guadalcanal, which continued for nearly six months, was accompanied by almost daily naval actions, resulting from the Japanese effort to reinforce the island. It is still astounding to realise the speed with which the Americans completed construction of an airstrip at Guadalcanal. Japanese troops had seen bulldozers at Wake Island when it fell in the first month of the war, and were greatly impressed by their performance. When the Japanese commanding officer of Wake ordered a labour detail of 300 men to repair the damaged airstrip, he was amazed to find that the job could be done by a handful of men in a matter of hours, using the powerful American machinery. It is curious that Japan did not reproduce these captured machines in quantity for her own war use. American planes were flying from Guadalcanal fields a week after the initial landing, and their number seemed to increase almost daily. Meanwhile, the supply of Japanese planes dwindled so rapidly that by the end of August there were fewer than 50 planes in the area. Combined fleet then brought in air reinforcements and started a series of attrition battles for the Solomons. The naval actions that took place for the island of Guadalcanal are well known to all readers of the Pacific War. To a degree, these battles paralleled the actions of almost 40 years earlier, when the Japanese Navy undertook the siege of Port Arthur against the Russians. I wish to point out these parallels and emphasise the special features of the Guadalcanal actions that had grave implications for the later development of the war. In 1904, during the Russo-Japanese War, 
Port Arthur, with its well-protected forts, withstood two general offensives over a period of four months, at great cost to the Japanese army. An imperial rescript was issued to encourage the troops, and General Nogi announced that if the next attack failed, he would himself, with drawn sword, led a suicide unit. Ten years earlier, in the Sino-Japanese War, Port Arthur had fallen to the Japanese in one day, and there were many who thought it would be just as easy to take Port Arthur from the Russians. In fact, when the first general offensive began on 24 August 1904, news reporters stayed in the war office all night, waiting minute by minute for word that Port Arthur had fallen. But it took four long months of bitter fighting, and cost Japan 59,000 officers and men, before Port Arthur was finally captured on New Year's Day of 1905. The American landings at Guadalcanal, as we have seen, provoked immediate concern among officers of the Japanese Navy. The army, on the other hand, pursued other operations, and it was not until 21 August that an army detachment under Lieutenant Colonel Kionao Ichiki made the first attempt, intending to recapture the island in one day. The effort ended in miserable failure, as had the Port Arthur venture of 1904. The army attacked again a week later with a force of 7,000 men commanded by Major General Kiyotake Kawaguchi. Preparations were laid more carefully on this occasion, and the effort was thorough. Defeat, however, was even more thorough and further reminiscent of Port Arthur. In Imperial General Headquarters, the army section now realised for the first time that the strength and fighting spirit of the enemy at Guadalcanal were more than had been anticipated. A third general offensive was staged on 24 October, with a division and a half built around the 2nd Sendai Division, under Lieutenant General Masao Maruyama. The attack was supported by the full strength of the 2nd and 3rd fleets. The troops were confident of victory, but this attack was also a debacle. These repeated failures caused grave concern in Imperial General Headquarters. The wisdom of trying to wage a decisive battle over Guadalcanal was seriously reconsidered. The night battle defeat of the famed 2nd Sendai Division had been a particularly heavy blow, because this was one of the best and toughest night fighting divisions in Japan, having to its credit the successful night attack on Crescent Hill during the Russo-Japanese War. It was decided to shift the emphasis from night attack to regular heavy artillery action in order to recapture the island. For this purpose, the 38th and 59th Divisions were, starting at the end of October, organised into the 8th Area Army under Lieutenant General Hitoshi Imamura, with headquarters at Rabul. Preparations for the next big general offensive were well underway by the end of December. An imperial rescript was prepared for issuance in the new year, to express concern for the military situation in the Solomons, as had been done 39 years previously in regard to Port Arthur, but this time it was not issued. The new year brought a change of plans in Imperial General Headquarters. It was clear that another major setback in the Solomons area would mean an unbearable loss of prestige for the army, and defeat seemed almost certain. After nearly five months of trying to reinforce and recapture Guadalcanal, Japanese military leaders realised that it would be foolhardy to transport thousands of troops into a theatre of action where the enemy had complete command of the air. Thus, on 4 January 1943, the decision was made to withdraw Japanese troops from Guadalcanal. This evacuation, which involved the removal of 11,000 troops, was completed on 8 February, whereupon organised resistance on the island came to an end. There too ends the parallel between the sieges for Port Arthur and Guadalcanal. Thirty-nine years earlier, Japan had been victorious. At the beginning of World War II, Japan had successfully concentrated her military and naval strength on specific targets. Guadalcanal, like Midway, was an example of Japan's failure to concentrate, and it, like Midway, ended in failure. If our military leaders had grasped the significance of the enemy landings at Guadalcanal early enough, and had concentrated a maximum effort at the proper time, they might have succeeded in driving the enemy from the island. When the Americans were able to reinforce the troops of the initial landings, Japan's cause there was lost. Meanwhile, GHQ had been prompting the Navy to take some action, and the Naval General Staff was urging an engagement of the enemy fleet off Guadalcanal to assist the army in recapturing the island. Combined Fleet Headquarters issued a desideratum to Rabul, 
that the task force sortie for a decisive battle in Guadalcanal waters. A desideratum was sent rather than an order because of Admiral Yamamoto's aversion to commanding his forces into battle against unreasonable odds. The actual decision was left to Admiral Nagumo and his chief of staff, Rear Admiral Ryonosuke Kusaka. They considered the situation at Guadalcanal, the wishes of GHQ, and the opinion of the combined fleet. It was decided that Third Fleet should sortie to the south as screen for a reinforcement convoy under Rear Admiral Raiso Tanaka, which left Rabaul on 19 August. The task force, made up of carriers Shokaku, Zuikaku, Ryujo, battleships Hiei, Kirishima, heavy cruisers Kumano, Suzuya, Tone, Chikuma, light cruiser Nagara, and 14 destroyers. Light carrier Ryujo with Tone and two destroyers were detached to operate a diversionary group. As such, they received the brunt of the attacks and Ryujo was sunk. The main force was sighted on 24 August by an enemy scout plane, which shadowed the warships for an hour and a half and dropped a bomb from high altitude as it departed. The bomb fell between Zuikaku and Shokaku, but did no damage. The next scout plane appeared shortly and dropped a bomb on Zuikaku's flight deck. Thereupon the task force withdrew to launch two waves of its own reconnaissance planes. These planes found the enemy's carrier group 250 miles to the southeast. Thereupon the first attack group of 67 planes was launched, led by Lieutenant Commander Seki. It was followed by a second group of 48 planes, commanded by Lieutenant Commander Murata. These veteran pilots brought back reports that they had sunk or heavily damaged three carriers, one battleship, five heavy cruisers and four destroyers of the enemy force. American announcements of this engagement mentioned merely that the enemy had inflicted some losses. Carrier Enterprise was hit by bombs and caught fire, billowing a huge smoke column. Her attackers had reason to think she was mortally damaged, but her fires were brought under control and the huge ship survived the action. Japanese rejoiced at the thought that they had sunk Carrier Hornet, flagship of the Doolittle Raid, and thus avenged the 18 April airstrike on Tokyo. The thought was premature. Japan's losses in this action were by no means slight. Light carrier Ryujo was sunk, Shokaku's flight deck was damaged, and Zuikaku received minor injuries. In addition, 70 planes and their trained crews were lost. Most of all, the Japanese effort had failed. In the third Solomon Sea battle, the enemy scored a similar victory. At that time, Japan's principal task force had returned to the inland sea, leaving Admiral Kondo's second fleet to cooperate with the army forces fighting on Guadalcanal. On 12 November, battleships Hiei and Kirishima, accompanied by a destroyer flotilla, were on a mission to bombard shore facilities at Lunga Point when they met and engaged an enemy surface force. In a fierce action, the Japanese lost battleship Hiei and destroyers Akatsuki and Yudachi, but managed to sink or damage a dozen enemy ships. In the actions of 12 to 13 November, United States naval losses were sunk, light cruisers Atlanta, Juno destroyers Cushing, Monson, Laffey, Barton damaged, heavy cruisers Portland, San Francisco, light cruiser, Helena destroyers Sterilt, Buchanan, O'Bannon, Aaron Ward. On 14 November, Admiral Kondo commanded a force of one battleship, two heavy and two light cruisers, and nine destroyers to escort the Army's 38th Division in a reinforcement effort for Guadalcanal. The enemy came out to meet this operation with a large fleet which included two new 16-inch battleships of the Idaho class. After several night clashes, the battle ended with the sinking of three enemy ships. Sunk in this action were destroyers Preston, Wolke and Benham, and Japanese loss of battleship Kirishima and destroyer Ayanami. The Mikawa force, covering the troop transport convoy, was subjected to persistent aerial attacks which sank heavy cruiser Kinugasa and seven of the eleven transports. This series of engagements, known as the Third Solomon's Sea Battle, was another Japanese defeat, and the fleet returned home. The enemy task force withdrew temporarily from the area, but his air bases on Guadalcanal were extended and his aerial activity was stepped up. Japan, on the other hand, had a mere 30 planes based in southern Bougainville, and they managed only infrequent airstrikes against Guadalcanal. The enemy held command of the air at Guadalcanal from the time his first airbase was set up there, 
and his area of control in the Solomons increased with each passing day. A scouting flight by a Japanese seaplane at daybreak on 18 November revealed the presence of six enemy airstrips on Guadalcanal, with hundreds of planes readied for operations. The build-up of enemy air strength had been much faster than we had anticipated. In addition, Admiral Halsey's task force in the area, augmented by several carriers, was in undisputed command of air and sea in the Southern Solomons. In November, there were on Guadalcanal nearly 15,000 Japanese officers and men, thousands of whom were incapacitated by sickness, malaria, stomach disorder, malnutrition. All day they had to fight against steadily growing enemy land forces. At night they were engaged in receiving such food, ammunition, stores and medical supplies as might be brought in by fast destroyers or submarines. These grocery runs were made at full speed, under cover of darkness on moonless nights. In hope of avoiding air attacks, Japanese destroyers stayed by day at Shortland Bay in Bougainville. Yet even there they were subjected to bombing attacks by the far-ranging American planes. These regular bombings were dubbed tikibin, meaning scheduled runs. When the air raid alarm sounded, all ships would get underway and manoeuvre violently, swinging their bows hard left or right to dodge the falling bombs. These attacks came so frequently and regularly that the destroyer skippers began to look forward to them as a chance for practising evasive tactics. Admiral Tomiji Koyanagi, commander of the destroyer squadrons, nicknamed these evasive manoeuvres the Bond Dance because of their left and right swinging movements, so reminiscent of the dancing in the annual Bond Festival of Lanterns. The dance of the destroyers was laughable, if one could ignore the deadly consequences of a misstep. By night, various means were employed to bring provisions to Guadalcanal. The most effective method was to have the supplies loaded in metal drums, strung together with rope, and hung from the gunnels of destroyers. Around midnight, a ship would run at high speed toward a designated point on the beach. As it approached shoal water, the string of drums was cut loose, and the destroyer went into a sharp turn, dumping its cargo and heading back for Bougainville. Parties from shore, swimming or in small boats, secured a lead line to the chain of provisions and hauled it to the beach where, tug-of-war fashion, the precious supplies were pulled from the water. This procedure had to be completed before daybreak, when enemy planes or patrol craft would detect the operation and machine-gun the working parties. For the troops ashore and the destroyer crews, the risk involved was extremely great, but there was no question of hazard pay. The men carried out this precarious programme, daring the enemy's blockade by sea and air, sustained by their loyalty to emperor and comrades in arms. The futile effort to reinforce Guadalcanal continued for six months. At the end of January 1943, the Japanese High Command finally decided that the island should be abandoned and evacuation of the island was begun by destroyers on the night of 1 February. That evacuation was an amazing success in itself. It took a total of 60 sorties to remove the Japanese garrison from Guadalcanal. The transport destroyers used for this purpose had to operate under heavy aerial attacks by the enemy. Combined fleet headquarters had anticipated that half of them would be lost, yet not one ship was damaged during the operation. This good fortune was due in part to the fact that a destroyer is small and fast, and therefore a poor target, but in addition, during the supply runs, which lasted for two and a half months, the officers and crews achieved mastery of the problems of navigation and evasion. Hence, the withdrawal of the Japanese garrison from Guadalcanal was one of the great tactical successes of World War II. The Naval High Command was greatly concerned, now ever, at having to use destroyers for such supply operations, in which a number of them had been lost. Even more important than the losses was the detrimental effect that taxi operations would have on crews in the future. The undignified use of destroyers as supply ships was demoralising to sailors who had been trained for traditional combat operations. With this in mind, it was proposed to develop a special transport destroyer, to be used exclusively for supply and transport operations, leaving regular destroyers and their crews to proper combat duties. Long before the proposal was put into effect, however, Guadalcanal was evacuated, and so the plan for transport destroyers was abandoned. Deplorable as was this destroyer situation, the story of misused submarines is even sorrier. 
When first-line submarines were employed almost exclusively in the demeaning task of supply operations, the war for Japan took on a gloomy aspect despite many great naval victories. Early in the effort of supplying Guadalcanal by surface ship, it was realised that nocturnal destroyer runs could not bring in enough material. Accordingly, submarines were detailed to the same task. As need for supplies increased, more submarines were assigned until, by January the 1943, 38 submarines were eventually involved. This submerged freight service cost Japan the loss of 20 submarines and their seasoned crews. During this period, another four submarines were sunk in the Solomons area while on regular patrol. The loss of 24 submarines in a few short months was bad enough, but it was especially painful that 20 of these aggressive fighting machines should be lost in the course of non-aggressive operations for which they were never intended. Submarines assigned to this duty were stripped of all torpedoes, shells and guns to make room for supplies. Crews were dejected when informed of their mission, even though they realised the importance of bringing needed materials to Guadalcanal. It was a further blow to morale when the crews witnessed enemy submarines on proper offensive missions in the same area, attacking our ships and disrupting our supply lines. Quite naturally, our submariners felt that their proper and primary task was to cut off the line of supply between the mainland of the United States and Guadalcanal, or to attack the line of communication between Guadalcanal and Australia. Disruption of the enemy's line of communication to Guadalcanal so much more extended than that of Japan, would have been far easier for Japanese submarines had they been allowed to pursue their proper function, and it would also have been far more profitable to the Japanese war effort. With only three Japanese submarines engaged in offensive operations around Guadalcanal, it is to their great credit that they succeeded in sinking the enemy aircraft carrier WASP. The poor showing of Japanese submarines in World War II as compared with those of Germany and the United States, must be attributed in major part to their unwise employment in late 1942 and early 1943. If the 30-odd Japanese submarines available in the Solomons had been mobilised offensively to the east and south of Guadalcanal, they could have seriously disrupted enemy convoys and been a great threat to the supply strategy of the United States. When Japanese submarines were finally released from logistic support operations, and resumed regular offensive tasks, there was a marked increase in their effectiveness against enemy ships. Losses at Guadalcanal, if dragged on long enough, would have led to certain defeat for Japan. Therefore, on the last day of 1942, the naval staff urged the evacuation of the island. When the decision was announced by General Headquarters, it was referred to as an advance by turning. In a wartime lecture at Keio University, I used the phrase strategic retreat to describe the situation and was promptly cautioned by the security police. Military leaders, extremely sensitive about the operations at Guadalcanal, insisted on the use of their own phraseology. It had seemed to me that the phrase advance by turning was a logical impossibility, for Japan lies to the north and to turn northward was to turn backward, not to advance. Thus the chosen phrase was itself a denial of logic which could have fooled no one who bothered to study a map. Japanese withdrawal from the island was completed by mid-February 1943, and army and navy forces were finally released from a bitter, bloody and costly struggle. The release proved to be of short duration, as the enemy maintained his offensive tempo. With accelerated zeal and fighting spirit, he pushed up the Solomon's chain and pursued the series of attrition battles which sapped the blood and energy of Japan's hitherto indomitable fighting machine. Japan lost 893 planes and 2,362 airmen in the half-year which ended with the withdrawal from Guadalcanal. During the following year, 1943, Japan lost 6,203 planes and 4,824 men, the staggering total of 7,096 planes lost was three times more than the number of planes Japan had boasted at the beginning of the Pacific War. Factories accelerated their production of planes, but never caught up with the losses. Moreover, training of new plane crews could not be achieved in short order, and the loss of the experienced veterans of Pearl Harbor, the Indian Ocean and Midway was irreparable. 
United States plans in the Solomon's battles probably did not have as their specific purpose the destruction of Japan's air power. It just happened that way. The American strategic objective was simply to advance northward for eventual battle on the Japanese homeland. The leapfrog strategy, which was so effective in Europe, was used also in the Pacific. First, the target area was repeatedly bombed, then shelled by warships to reduce further the enemy's resistance before landing. With the occupation of the target area, airstrips were immediately built and air superiority was extended toward the capture of the next target area. At the end of the war, the United States had 40,893 first-line planes and 60 aircraft carriers. Japan's navy was overwhelmed from the sky. Japan fought well at the Solomons, but when the ratio of strength was 100 to 30, the results were foreordained. As a poor farmer is often himself forced to consume what he produces for sale and finally ends up in debt, so Japan was using up planes faster than she could build them. The United States reaped the double harvest of geographical advance and dissipation of Japan's air strength. Japanese military spokesmen eventually began to mention the enemy's material superiority. Yet that superiority had been obvious since long before the war began. Japan advanced too far beyond her strength or, to use a military term, had exceeded the offensive terminal point. When an advancing army crosses a certain point, its strength diminishes. Supply lines lengthen, the territory of the advance becomes increasingly hostile and uncooperative, and troops reach a point of fatigue which even the thrill of victory cannot surmount. All of these elements reduce the fighting capability of the offensive army, and they inevitably give a counter-offensive advantage to the defending force. When the resulting counter-attack succeeds, the initiative is taken by the defenders, and the invading army loses ground at an accelerating speed. The offensive terminal point lies one step before the line at which the tide of battle turns. It is the ideal point for the offensive force to hold, rest and strengthen its lines of communication, supply and reinforcements before taking the next forward step. In May 1942, I wrote a series of articles for the Chubu Nihon Shimbun of Nagoya entitled The Offensive Terminal Point. My intention was to oppose indirectly the further southward advances. An influential businessman of Osaka, who read an early instalment in the series, wrote a letter saying, Your article confirmed my concern and anxiety. I would like to read all of the series. On the other hand, long afterward an army acquaintance, Colonel Tanihagi, who later rose to Lieutenant General, advised me not to write my ideas so explicitly, lest the sensitive army officials take action against me. In theory, and with benefit of hindsight, it is easy to establish the offensive terminal point of a military offensive operation. In practice, and on the battle line, it is difficult not only to determine when an offensive effort has reached its optimum point, but also, when it is properly determined, to do anything about it. This is true of any nation and of any war. A military leader on the offensive tends to push onward, and it is almost impossible for the rear area headquarters to check the aggressive commander, even after it is realised that his aggression is unwise. Efforts at restraint come too late. To the average observer or participant, the optimum point of an offensive effort is hidden. It can be realised only by a superior commanding officer, who must be able to discern when he has reached the point where he must consolidate his forces and lines for the next offensive. That point between the successful terminus of the first offensive and the beginning of the next offensive is known as the strategic interval. The strategic interval cannot be determined unilaterally. An enemy counter-offensive may disrupt or completely destroy the most careful plans for the strategic interval. Therefore, a commander, to know his real strength, must be able to visualise his offensive terminal point and estimate properly the strategic interval before beginning his next offensive. During the Russo-Japanese War of 1904 to 1905, an interval of two months was allowed to consolidate lines of advance as the Japanese army moved from Telisu to Liaoyang, and then to Shaho, and finally to Mukden, which was considered to be the terminal point for the offensive advance. In the Pacific War, such a strategic interval was not possible for the Japanese. After the withdrawal from Guadalcanal, Japan had hoped for a one-year strategic interval 
in which to build up air strength impoverished during the second half of the Solomon's campaign. The enemy, however, was unobliging. The United States not only did not slacken its pace, but on the contrary, stepped up its offensive and began air attacks on the Marianas before Japan was even half prepared. The strategic interval for the United States was extremely brief and its offensive terminal point deeply advanced. The offensive terminal point for any army is related to its strength, supply requirements, and the speed with which the supplies can be delivered. The terminal point for the United States lay far distant from its homeland, while Japan was forced to fix her terminal point comparatively close to home bases. Japan had to advance to the south to get oil, without which she could not pursue the war. Japan had started the war knowing that she did not have enough tankers to carry oil from the South Seas to the mainland, but she had counted on capturing tankers to supplement those of her own fleet. Therefore, in the initial stages of the war, when the navy was sinking enemy merchant ships, Imperial Naval Headquarters ordered that an effort be made to capture them instead. Once begun, the war had to be fought through. It is now clear, however, that Japan went to war totally ignoring from the outset the offensive terminal point. Imperial headquarters should have fixed the offensive terminal point in time to maintain forces within the maximum areas of battle required to secure oil fields and maintain lines of supply. Extended pursuit of the enemy invites the danger that he will sever supply lines. It was feared by some that even Rabul was beyond the offensive terminal point. Islands differ strategically from land masses, and it was inevitable that the advance would continue from one island to another. But the Japanese advance should have stopped at Rabul, at the northern end of the Solomons. Our admirals and generals on the front lines lacked jurisdiction over such matters, and it was probably too much to expect the necessary insight and courage from imperial headquarters, whose poor judgment was actually to blame for the defeat in the Solomons. Between August 1942 and February 1944, the Pacific War was focused around Guadalcanal and the northern adjoining islands of the Solomon Archipelago. During that year and a half, the Pacific Ocean elsewhere saw no naval engagements of note. In December 1943, the United States learned of the presence of a Japanese airstrip on Kwajalein in the Marshalls. Until then, the stage for decisive battle had remained in the south, far removed from Japan. Now it drew closer to the homeland. Meanwhile, as the United States counteroffensive advanced northward from Tulagi and Guadalcanal, the character of naval warfare changed from traditional surface engagements between great fleets to landing operations and their various supporting actions. The war goal of the United States was to advance along the road to Tokyo. On 2 July 1942, the United States Joint Chiefs of Staff adopted Operation Watchtower for the purpose of capturing Tulagi and adjacent strategic points, with Admiral Nimitz as naval commander. And General MacArthur had as his immediate goal the occupation of Papua as the first step toward garnering the rest of New Guinea in his northward march. It was a strange spectacle to see the United States Army and Navy divided in operations toward the same goal in the same area. The Navy and its Marine Corps were attacking Tulagi and Guadalcanal, while the Army was striking at Bougainville and Rabul. It seemed, therefore, that Japan could have won the battles of Guadalcanal and the Solomons if she had taken advantage of this divided effort. Major General Anderson has said about Guadalcanal, if the Japanese army had thrown into the second general offensive what they used in the third attack, one and a half divisions, probably the Americans would have had to withdraw in defeat. Inter-service rivalry existed in Tokyo, to be sure, but on the fighting front both services cooperated fully, as was evident in Malaya, where General Tomoyuki Yamashita and Admiral Jisaburo Ozawa displayed perfect teamwork. In the Guadalcanal operations also, the Japanese army and navy cooperated. The Americans at the front, however, did not yield to each other. One conspicuous example of this occurred when an emergency policy conference was held on 4 September 1942 at Noumea to discuss the Japanese counteroffensive, which was endangering the American forward lines. Present at the conference were Admiral Nimitz, Sinkpak, General Arnold, Air Force Chief of Staff, Admiral Gormley, Commander-in-Chief, South Pacific, General Sutherland, Chief of Staff, Far Eastern Army, and General Turner, Commandant of Marine Corps. 
General MacArthur refused to come to the meeting. When Admiral Nimitz asked General MacArthur for 10,000 soldiers as reinforcements, MacArthur turned down the request, saying that he could not divert a single man from the New Guinea operations, even though he then had 55,000 men under his command. When MacArthur in turn asked Admiral Nimitz for a fleet with two carriers, one marine division and a squadron of large bombers for his northward operations, Nimitz refused and explained that operations at Guadalcanal would not permit such a diversion of his forces. When the situation at Guadalcanal became critical for the United States, President Roosevelt finally took direct measures to dissolve the inter-service rivalry. On 24 October 1942, he sent an emergency order as Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces, directing the immediate reinforcement of Guadalcanal. Until early 1943, the Allied powers regarded Europe as the primary theatre of operations, and 85% of all Allied forces were employed there. The Pacific was secondary. At the Casablanca Conference in January 1943, the main aim of the United States was to increase the allocation of forces in the Pacific to at least 30% of the total effort. With Pacific forces thus doubled, the United States hoped to conquer Japan and Germany at the same time. At Casablanca, President Roosevelt drew a good deal of attention by proposing increased use of submarines, pointing out that they could most economically defeat Japan by sinking her ships. He also stressed the need for enlarging aerial activity against Japan by operating from bases in China. In keeping with these proposals, General Marshall and Admiral King emphasised the need for greater strength in the Pacific to secure the initiative. Even after the Japanese withdrawal from Guadalcanal, the United States did not think in terms of a decisive fleet surface engagement with Japan, but concentrated on invading the Japanese homeland. This was the theme of the meeting between Roosevelt and Churchill in Washington on 12 May 1943, and again at the Quebec Conference in August. The following routes were adopted as the logical roads to Tokyo. A. Marshalls, Truk, Marianas, Iwo, Japan. B. New Guinea, Mindanao, Luzon, Formosa, Okinawa, Japan. A bitter rivalry developed later between Admiral Nimitz, Route A, and General MacArthur, Route B, but both felt that more forces were necessary in the war against Japan, and they agreed on the general tactics of leapfrogging through the islands, using carrier-based air power, and bypassing the strong points. At the Cairo conference in early December 1943, the same two-route strategy was confirmed, and the objectives for 1944 were determined as follows. 1. The primary objective is to capture advance bases and force Japan into unconditional surrender. 2. Blockade Japan by submarine and air force, and destroy Japanese fleet units whenever possible. 3. Offensive action on Route B should be taken in conjunction with offensive action along Route A4, establish B-29 bases on Saipan, Guam and Tinian for strategic bombing of the Japanese mainland. At this time, Admiral King stated his conviction that the United States Navy would be strong enough to destroy the Japanese fleet before the spring of 1945. This appraisal, from a man who had a reputation for never exaggerating, deeply impressed all commanders of the United States Armed Forces. On 28 December 1943, the Joint Chiefs of Staff issued directives to Admiral Nimitz and General MacArthur to launch offensives along the prescribed routes as soon as possible. General MacArthur, not content with the strategy of this two-pronged offensive, sent his Chief of Staff, Lieutenant General R.K. Sutherland, to Washington in January to register his dissent. He firmly believed that Route B was the proper highway to Tokyo and that Route A was secondary. Admiral Nimitz, not to be outmaneuvered, sent his Chief of Staff, Rear Admiral Forrest Sherman, to refute MacArthur's contention. At the time, MacArthur had four United States and six Australian divisions. Nimitz had two Army and six Marine divisions. In Washington, Vice Admiral Russell Wilson, Army Lieutenant General Stanley D. Embick, and Air Force Major General Muir S. Fairchild of the Joint Strategic Survey Committee tried to smooth out the differences. They recommended the elimination of Truk from Route A and of Mindanao from Route B. They emphasised the importance of Saipan and recommended that losses be kept to a minimum. Still, the rivalry persisted between MacArthur and Nimitz. President Roosevelt finally invited the two commanders to a conference in Hawaii. 
It took place 27 to 28 July, and the meeting effected a reconciliation between the two men and their ideas. It was decided that Nimitz should dispatch his carrier task forces to help MacArthur, and that MacArthur should bypass Formosa. Turning to Japan, we see a different kind of rivalry. The Battle of the Solomons was fought mainly by the Naval Air Force. Plane losses ran to the staggering total of 7,000. The nation's total capacity for plane production should have been mobilised to replenish these losses. The Army, however, insisted on one half of all aircraft production for its own use. Since the Army Air Force had sustained no losses in the Solomons, it should have relinquished its quota to the Navy, but it did not. Two decades earlier, when the Navy under Admiral Tomosaburo Kato was feverishly trying to build its 8-8 fleet, the Minister of War, General Gichi Tanaka, offered to divert part of his appropriations to assist the Navy's expansion. Such understanding and cooperation, however, could not be expected from the army leadership of General Tojo. The Navy's antipathy toward Tojo was extreme, and men in the Navy Ministry were correspondingly disturbed by their weak leadership in Admiral Shigetaro Shimada. In the United States, harmony prevailed at the highest level of command, while discord erupted between field commanders. In Japan, on the other hand, there was harmony among field commanders of both various services, but disunity and friction at general headquarters. Meanwhile, the scheduled offensives were launched by Admiral Nimitz in the Gilberts and the Marshals, and by General MacArthur in New Guinea. Japan had no way of knowing which was the main offensive line. She abandoned the Solomon's operations, gave up her outer perimeters, and was forced to withdraw to an inner defensive line along the Marianas and the Philippines. This forced withdrawal left Japan with makeshift lines which were indefensible. If she had been content with these inner defensive lines in the first place, and had devoted her efforts to establishing strong positions along these lines, she would have given a much better account of herself.